everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Chris Gluck. I'm a uh, member of Catholic or uh, Peace Fellowship, um, one of the co-sponsors on campus, and I'd like to start off with a prayer. As Christ said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Lord, we ask that you bless our gathering here this evening. We thank you for prophets, those who gather us together and gather us to you. We ask that you grant us the courage to heed their words and to continue to build the community of Christ among us. We ask this in your name. Good evening and peace. Thank you all for being here. My name is Maria Surratt and I'm a second year student in the Master of Divinity program here at Notre Dame. Dorothy Day's vision and radical witness to the gospel have guided me in following Jesus Christ. Dorothy's life and holiness have encouraged me and many others to see that another world, the world of God's peaceable kingdom, is not only possible, but actually does exist. I am graced to be a close friend of the St. Peter Claver Catholic Worker Community here in South Bend, and I am deeply moved by Dorothy and the Catholic Worker's commitment to personalism and gospel nonviolence. I am grateful to continue reflecting on these themes as I work with the Catholic Peace Fellowship as my field education placement this year. Guided by a personalist philosophy and striving to work for peace before, during, and after war, the Catholic Peace Fellowship is an organization to which Dorothy was an advisor and that continues to be inspired by her. Both the Catholic Worker and the Catholic Peace Fellowship are fruits born of Dorothy Day's witness to Jesus Christ, and both have been formative in my life. For these reasons, I feel particularly blessed to introduce to you tonight's speaker, Martha Hennessy. Martha will reflect with us on her grandmother, Dorothy Day's life and discipleship. Martha Hennessy lives and works between her family homestead in Vermont and Mary House Catholic Worker in Lower Manhattan. She is the seventh of nine grandchildren to Dorothy Day. Martha also serves on the steering committee of the Guild for the Canonization of Dorothy Day. Martha is herself a grandmother, and she works very part-time as an occupational therapist. She has traveled to the Middle East, Russia, Europe, and Afghanistan in search of peacemaking and cultural understanding. She participates in resistance work against war, torture, nuclear power, and nuclear weapons. Martha states, I am committed to the Catholic worker tradition of welcoming the needy, celebrating the dignity of work, and speaking out against war and injustice, all grounded on a foundation of prayer. Martha will speak to us tonight for about 40 minutes, followed by an opportunity for questions and comments. Thanks to the sponsors of this evening's talk, and on behalf of those sponsors, the Catholic Peace Fellowship, the Notre Dame Peace Fellowship, the Center for Social Concerns, University Life Initiatives, the Institute for Church Life, Moreau Seminary, Global Zero Notre Dame, and the Notre Dame Master of Divinity Program. Thank you, Martha, for coming this evening. Please join me in welcoming Martha Hennessy. Thank you all for having me, and do you hear me well enough in the back? And I'm sorry, this podium is kind of big for me. Um, well, I really can't thank Sean and everyone else enough. They've worked very hard to get me here. Um, I don't do many of these talks. It's rather nerve-wracking. And But I think it's really important, so, so I'm very grateful to be here, and thank you all for coming out. 
I do, I know that we started with a prayer, but I have another one for us. I think it's important to begin endeavors with prayers. And this is one that one of my earliest spiritual directors, it was one of his favorites, and he recommended it to me, and it's Gerard Manley Hopkins. And it's actually a poem. Jesu, that dost in Mary dwell, be in thy servants' hearts as well, in the spirit of thy holiness, in the fullness of thy force and stress, in the very ways that thy life goes, and virtues that thy pattern shows, in the sharing of thy mysteries, and every power in us that is against thy power put under feet, in the Holy Ghost, the paraclete, to the glory of the Father. Amen. So as Maria had introduced me, I, I do spend my time between uh, Vermont and New York. I was raised in Vermont. Uh, my family moved there in 1957. And I'm still on the same property that I grew up on. And both of my children were born there as well. And so I have a, a wonderful life of continuity and connection to the land. Um, I am part Irish, and so I do have these roots that go deep into the soil. Um, we grow perhaps 60% of the food that we eat. Um, we raise sheep and chickens and eggs and fruits and vegetables. And the soil there is very, very fertile. My parents chose a wonderful location to, to raise nine kids. I'm number seven of nine children. And I have worked as an occupational therapist um, for 25 years, working with uh, students with learning differences and working with the elderly. And I do feel that just about every serious decision that I've ever had to make in my life has been influenced by my grandmother, no doubt whatsoever. And I spent my... 20s and 30s and 40s out of the Catholic Church and not involved with the Catholic worker. Um, as kids, we spent a lot of time at the Tivoli Farm visiting our grandmother and in New York visiting St. Joseph House on First Street. But when I was um, raising my kids and getting them through college, I was not at all involved with the Catholic worker or the Catholic Church. And then I came back. Dorothy died in 1980 when I was 25 years old. And I didn't set foot in Mary House until 2004. And that's a whole other complex story in terms of my return um, to the Catholic Church. But now I am working at Mary House half time. And it's not easy being in two worlds at once. I have my husband at home, and he works full time as a carpenter. And we have my daughter, our youngest. We have three kids and six grandchildren. And our youngest um, spent five years in Denver after graduating college. She's a labor and delivery nurse. And she now lives next door to us with a 17-month-old. So that's really lovely to have that. But I do travel down to Mary House. And what we do at Mary House is we provide um, housing for perhaps 10 homeless women. And we have maybe 20 people living in the house. We have the soup line four days a week. And that includes showers for the women, access to telephone use, and um, the clothing room. A lot of the women very much need clothing, especially in the wintertime. And so I spend my days at Mary House doing very much what I've done as a mother and as a wife. Um, cleaning, cooking, um, sitting with people, talking with people. Uh, in part of my training as an occupational therapist, there was a term that I came across. It was um, relating to how we interact with patients, the therapeutic use of self. And I find that this has been a very important part of what I do, the witness and the work at Mary House. Just simply being there for the women, telling their stories. I do find that I'm a, a bit too much of a Martha, and I'm in the kitchen cleaning and, and doing dis dishes and running about, so I really have to remind myself to sit and be more 
contemplative uh, with the women. But the work I find to be challenging on a, on a daily basis, I'm a perfectionist. I've run my own household for many years, and I have these expectations. And I do remember Dorothy saying to folks when they got exacerbated, uh, exasperated with um, living conditions at the houses, lower your expectations. So I have certainly had to learn that um, in terms of cleanliness and organization. So it's a very good exercise for me, indeed. It, it, living in community rubs the rough edges off of us. Very important aspect of living the gospel teachings, you know, sharing everything that you have in common. I suppose people love to hear stories about Granny. We call Dorothy Granny. And it's good to tell uh, personal stories. She spent a lot of time with us. Um, my first memory, of course, was when I was quite young. Um, she would come to visit in Vermont just to get away from things. She was very busy, always busy, reading, writing, traveling, speaking. And she would try and spend as much time as she could with her, her daughter, my mother, and her sister, Della. But she would come to the house, and we would drive her crazy, especially when we were uh, teenagers. Um, she really had to put up with a lot of chaos, and uh, we, grew, we were growing up in the 1960s and 70s, and as you can imagine, things were very, very different there. A lot, a lot of things were going on. Um, I think one of my clearest memories of her was when I was 16 and my sister Mary, I have a sister Mary and a, Mar and a sister Margaret. We were called the three M's. And we were visiting Dorothy at St. Joe's. And I was 16 and my sister Mary was 20 and we were working very hard. She would always put us to work. We were mopping and sweeping. And she looked at me and she said, Martha, you need to be more like Mary. And I was just crushed as a 16 year old. To, to hear that, um, but now it's one of my favorite memories of her. And so I think for me it's been a very long journey in understanding what Dorothy was showing us in a, in a very gentle, very low profile, even nonverbal way. She was showing us how to live the gospel teachings, how to, how to practice the works of mercy, how to have, um, develop kindness and peacefulness within the family. And of course, the family being the first unit, that's our greatest challenge, is how we interact with, within our families. And so she was a very gentle, very kind person. She was a very ordinary person. I often um, get responses in terms of being the, uh, the grandchild, a grandchild. The response is either, who was she? Was that Doris Day? Or, <laughs> or simply, who was that? Or simply having an, an, knowing who she was and having extreme reverence for her. So really, real extremes in terms of people's response to her. But she was both very ordinary and very extraordinary. There was a presence to her that was certainly something that I became aware of as a very young child. I want to give you a brief timeline um, of the Catholic worker history. And uh, I'm sorry if I go on forever with this, but I have a lot that I want to share with you. Um, but the Catholic worker was born of crisis, born in um, the middle of the uh, Great Depression, and the, the Dust Bowl was occurring. People were being displaced. Um, farmers were being very displaced. Huge migrations were occurring around the country. And so Dorothy and Peter came together to try and understand how to serve the immediate needs of the poor, how to respond in a time of crisis. And Dorothy was very much embedded in our US history, the, the decades of the 20s, the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. So much was happening. And she was very much in the thick of it. Being a journalist, being a writer, she was there observing and reporting. So I would just start with what I learned uh, reading about her in her biographies and her autobiography, that she really did feel the sense of God, the presence of God as a child. And I love the stories that she told about growing up 
her very early years in Brooklyn and going out and playing in the marshes near the, the river. And she also talked about the San Francisco earthquake and having her first awareness of times of crisis and people coming together, pulling together to love and support each other in a time of crisis. And to describe that as a five-year-old, a six-year-old is pretty astounding. As a young adult, when she went off to college, she would spend all of her money on books and not get, get much sleep. Um, her father was very um, strict with her and her sister, and he controlled what they read. So she was free at last to explore all kinds of authors. She was such an avid reader. And this is where she really dipped into um, authors like Sinclair, London, Dickens, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Kropotkin, Monier, um, Debs. And so she very much learned firsthand the, the social conditions under industrialism and materialism. And she really was developing her, her faith even before she understood that she was to convert to Catholicism. From the years 1970 to 1924, World War I occurred. My grandfather had a nervous breakdown about being inducted into World War II. So that was the beginnings in my family of having a real understanding of the cost of war. And he suffered greatly over, over that anxiety. And she, during that time, served as a nurse at um, King's Hospital, King's County Hospital. And it was also in those years that she experienced um, an abortion and also her first arrest. And so she did have significant trauma in her life, you know, prior to the age of 21. And she also had a friend or an acquaintance die in her arms of a heroin overdose. So she, she had some very, very strong experiences at a young age. And she, she described herself as, during this bohemian life, as having done everything but drug addiction. My mother was born in 1926, and Dorothy um, described this as an incredible moment of conversion for her, the bringing forth of life. And she herself was baptized in 1927, and she describes that event as not necessarily a cheerful, happy, joyful event. She had a lot of misgivings and a lot of uncertainty about joining the church. She had her socialist experience, and she wasn't all that comfortable with what the hierarchy had represented and the things that the church had participated in down through history. And then she met um, Peter Morin through my um, great aunt, Tessa. Well, it was the um, editor of Commonweal magazine that got the two of them together. And Dorothy had gone to the Hunger March in 1932 in, in Washington and then prayed at the uh, Immaculate Conception Chapel. And when she got home, there was Peter. And it was Tessa's hospitality, my um, great uncle, Dorothy's youngest brother, John. His wife, Tessa, was the one who put up with Peter, let Peter stay at the apartment. And it was her early hospitality that really made this happen, of, of Peter and Dorothy coming together. And then, of course, the paper came out May 1st, 1933, the first issue, and that was handed out at Union Square. And it was during this time that the government was trying to respond to the crisis of unemployment and destitution. 1935-36, um, my mother clearly remembers the opening, the purchasing and opening of Easton Farm. It was the first farm to complement the city um, house of hospitality. And, my mother was very much a country person, so as a child, she was very anxious to get out of the city. And she had wonderful memories of the Easton Farm. And it was there um, that my mother also uh, met my father. But in that same time frame, Dorothy was picketing um, the German ocean liner, the Bremen, that came into New York Harbor. So very early on, she was quite aware of what was brewing uh, in Europe and did participate in that. I have to um, give you a disclaimer that my timeline is very much focused on resistance and, and radical concepts. Um, 1941, she protested World War II. She witnessed the dropping of the atomic bomb in 1945. She wrote about that, an incredible piece of writing describing the breathing in of our Japanese brothers and sisters in the fog of 
New York, and a very extraordinary example of her awareness of the mystical body, how we are all interrelated. Um, the Catholic worker really took a big um, hit with her protesting World War II because most people thought that that was a just war. We had to stop Hitler. But she stood very fast in her understanding of Christ's calling to put up the sword. And so I think half of the readership, the circulation dropped off and half of the houses closed at that time. And it was a movement that was growing very, very rapidly. My mother described it as just an unbelievable um, atmosphere of high energy, of getting the paper out, much, much excitement. In 1955, the year that I was born, she um, began with this participation in the protesting the New York City air raids, um, air raid drills. We were all being pre prepped for nuclear war, and she saw through the insanity of that. And so from 1955 to 61, I think, Every year, people sat out on the park benches and were arrested, and the crowds got bigger each year until it was ended, finally, in 1961. She was visiting um, the Koinonia interracial community in Georgia in 1957, and in that experience, she, she um, came into the crosshairs of locals who were quite violent and was shot at. A drive-by shooting occurred, apparently, while she was sitting vigil in a car. Um, in front of the community. 1962, she took a trip to Cuba in the post-revolution. She was blessing um, Fidel Castro's revolution because she understood what was trying to be done in terms of eliminating illiteracy, eliminating um, infant mortality rates, which did occur under the revolution. In 1963 to 65, she participated in um, the Vatican II Council in Rome. She did a lot of vigiling and fasting and hoping that more language would be included in terms of denouncing war and questioning a uh, just war stance. She condemns the Vietnam War in that period. She condemns all war. And it was in 1969 that my brother, I was 14, my brother was sent to Vietnam. So it was a very personal experience of war, not simply hearing of others. But for our family, it, w it was something that we understood firsthand. She had her last arrest in 1973 with um, Cesar Chavez and the migrant workers. And we have that iconic photo of her um, sitting there very placidly amongst the armed police. She received the Latari Medal here at Notre Dame 1972 to 74. I don't have the exact year of when that occurred. I think 72. She actually did her best to avoid receiving that award, but somehow things worked out that um, she was not able to politely decline because she was away traveling and she didn't respond in time. That's how the story goes, but she did not accept honorariums from Catholic institutions and, and universities that also practiced uh, training for war through ROTC. Um, Mary House was purchased in 1972, and that was up and started. She felt there was a great need for a women's house. A lot of the homeless shelters um, provided for men, and St. Joseph's House to this day is for men. So Mary House was brought into being in the mid-'70s, and she had a wonderful crew of nuns, maybe four or five nuns, who got that project up and running. And that, the house was filled up immediately with many women, unlike today. We, we can't seem to work as hard as they did back then. In 1977, for her 80th birthday, Pope John Paul VI sent her a birthday card, birthday greetings. And it was that year that she started having cardiac problems, her first heart attack. And in 1979, Mother Teresa visited her at Mary House. And she died November 29th in 1980, and my mother was there with her by her side. She spent the last five years um, living it and working at Mary House. And so we see Dorothy and Peter as apostles of the 20th century. They were the ones to bring good news of how to practice the works of mercy um, in our times. And the Catholic Worker Movement was one of the earliest um, lay movements in the US. 
um, to take on this kind of work. And I would like to read this excerpt um, that she wrote in 1955. It was something she wrote for a little pamphlet called The Gospel in Action. And she's describing the first um, uh, bits of work done to open the Catholic worker movement. The oldest, perhaps, speaking of lay movements, is the Catholic worker movement, which was started in 1932 with Peter Marne and myself as parents. Many others have associated themselves with us for longer or shorter periods in one or another aspect of the work. The work began in 1933 in the midst of the Depression with the publication of a paper which stressed as a program of action the participation in the works of mercy as an immediate way of combating the materialism of our industrial capitalist system on the one hand and the atheistic materialism of communism on the other. It was a time when state aid began to be glorified and the centralization and impersonalization of charity followed. The paper published by our little group emphasized over and over the personal responsibility of every one of its readers to be live members of the mystical body of Christ. Quote, you are all members one of another, and when the health of one member suffers, the health of the whole body is lowered, St. Paul wrote. And from this doctrine it followed that all the love expressed in action for God and our brother and sister, I added, increased the sum total of love in the world to overcome the hatred and strife let loose in our time. I think what I find so striking about her writings, um, other than her her in immense talent at writing, is the timelessness of what she says. What she says in her time can once again be applied over and over again with each new generation, unfortunately in some aspects for sure. I do want to review the some of the basic principles of the Catholic Worker Movement for you as well, since this is an educational institution. So, uh, one of the first and foremost um, principles is that of nonviolence and pacifism. And we do have a very illustrious character figure in our Catholic worker history, uh, in a man named Ammon Hennessy, no relation to my father. But Ammon was called the One Man Revolution. He did a lot of work, a lot of fasting and vigiling against uh, nuclear weapons. And Ammon talked about Becoming a pacifist is like being in recovery. It's an everyday exercise. It's one day at a time where we personally, in our lives, have to be rooting out the roots of war from our own hearts, our own violent um, dispositions, our own desires to take care of ourselves and to not think of the other person. And of course, this practice comes in the first unit of the family. Um, practicing pacifism with each other. I really struggle with this, as I mentioned earlier, every day, both in my family and in Mary House, of dealing with my own, what I call, internal imperialistic urges. And I think the sooner we're aware of that, the better off we are in trying to address that. Um, the second concept, voluntary poverty to take less so that others may have enough. And poverty, it, poverty is, as an act in itself, one of the greatest of resistance and the holiest work that can be done. As Americans, you know, as citizens of one of the most affluent empires in human history, we have an obligation to think about where our standard li of living has come from, the cost that is paid um, on the lives of others around the world. And so we're told to achieve and strive for achieve, achievement, strive for more wealth. And so this concept of voluntary poverty sets us on a very different track, a race to the bottom, if you will, which is so counter to what we've been taught as Americans. I do want to mention this concept of Sabbath economics. So this is something put out by Ched Myers, uh, theologian out on the West Coast. Sabbath economics tells us that God has given us enough and that what we need to do is bridle our greed and just take what we need. 
and capitalism has taught us the opposite, has turned Sabbath economics on its head, where shortage is created either in reality or in concept, and we are taught to consume as much as we can. And so the concept of voluntary poverty adds a whole do, new dimension of how to subvert the system of uh, profit motive. The third concept, hospitality and personalism. Dorothy talked about taking immediate action, confronting evil the moment you see it. And that can certainly be done by taking a per personalist stance, like the Good Samaritan, stopping and helping and assisting immediately and not thinking of oneself and what one needs to do to protect oneself. Also, thinking in terms of the common good. Um, she talked about a cold charity coming from the state not really being what Jesus intended for us. She, she and Peter both talked about having a Christ room in each home. And so hospitality, once again, brings us closer uh, to each other when we realize that we are our brother's keeper, and we can respond in a Christian manner to that. Peter Morin had um, written up uh, a list of the Catholic worker philosophy uh, points, and I do want to share that with you as well. And once again, we're looking at authentic discipleship. What does authentic discipleship look like? And the points that he made, he made many points. He was a nonstop talker. I, Remember my mother talking. You couldn't get a word in edgewise once he got on the soapbox. But the five points that I want to share with you, the first being to reach the man in the street with the social teachings of the Catholic Church, the, the Catholic social teachings. Number two, to reach the people through the practice of the corporal and spiritual works of mercy at a personal sacrifice. This is not theoretical. At a personal sacrifice, which means voluntary poverty. Number three, to build up a lay apostolate through roundtable discussions for the clarification of thought. Once again, dialogue, so important. Number four, to found houses of hospitality for the practice of the works of mercy. And number five, to found farming communes for the cure of unemployment. To solve the problem of the machine for the restoration of property and the resisting of the servile state for the building up of the family, the original community, the first unit of society. And so he, he talked a lot about the dignity of work. He was a peasant from the south of France, from a very large family, trained as a Christian brother. And he emigrated to Canada and worked on a farm and then worked his way across North America doing very menial hard labor, ditch digging. So he was a very interesting combination of both scholar and worker. Uh, Dorothy did complain a little bit about his uh, idiosyncrasies. Um, but again, we're, we're, we're faced with how do we follow an authentic discipleship? How do we live the gospel teachings? And I certainly feel that the Catholic worker model is ingenious, is well integrated. I mean, Dorothy lived her life in such an integrated manner. I mean, there's not this separation of work, home. Um, she, everything was integrated in her life in terms of what she did. And so for those of us who can take it, we explore, we explore that life in Catholic worker community. I do want to talk a little, about, a little bit about her daily faith practice and her charism. She freely gave her unique gifts of the Spirit to the world. Hers was a divinely inspired gift of the grace of faith, and she had immense talent for both writing and connecting with others. For her, the passion of Christ takes on the suffering of the poor, the oppressed, victims of war, and the voiceless. Her response was to seek social justice through nonviolence. She also practiced Benedictine holy work. She was an oblate of the Benedictine order, ora et labora, work and prayers, pr and prayer within a community that serves the destitute. And that was her charism. She very much admired the lives of the saints. She daily read about the saints and quoted the saints. Um, 
Her prayer life consisted of daily mass. She was a daily communicant. Um, she said the rosary. She taught us the rosary. We said that at bedtime. She also believed firmly in weekly confession, which I think is a very important aspect of practice of faith. And then she also participated um, with Vespers each evening in the, in the community setting. I think that her writing was certainly a form of prayer. And she spent a lot of time simply sitting in front of the Eucharist, praying, writing, reading, meditating. And so I believe she was a supplicant each time she sat down to write. And it was certainly the influence of God that, that helped her to find that vocation and to express it you know, through her writings. I want to review the Catholic social teachings. Peter referred to this as the dynamite of the church. And he talked about the church is sitting on a box full of dynamite. And they're holding the lid down as much as they can. And with Pope Francis, we have a lot of hope. I think that he is willing to blow the top off of that box of dynamite. And so Dorothy certainly referenced the encyclicals, and her life included trying to bring this theory into practice. She had to endure the witnessing of one war after the next in her lifetime, and she relied very much on the Catholic social teachings, which Peter had instructed her on, indoctrinated her on, because she was quite ignorant as an adult convert. She talked about the dying to the self, which I had a very hard time understanding as, a, as an adult. But as we study these social teachings, it becomes clear to me what that means, what that means in terms of participating in community for the good of all, the greater good, the common good of all. And so, of course, you know, these ideals of the Catholic social teachings are a theory, and there's always a gap between theory and practice for us. <coughs> And it is our human nature um, to, to run counter to what these teachings are giving us. And being in this world is, is always a challenge. I mean, we're dealing with our eagle, egos, we're dealing with our material attachments, but let's pay closer attention to these, um, these doctrines. And I just want to review them, the, the, some of the titles, the dates they were written, and which pope um, had worked on them. On the Condition of Labor came out in 1891, Pope Leo XIII. This is very crucial in terms of what's happening today in, in, in the destruction of labor unions and the middle class. Forty years later was written in 1931, Pope Pius XI. Peace on Earth, I refuse to use the Latin terms just because I stumble over the pronunciation and we need to understand what's being said here. Peace on Earth in 1963. Um, Pope John the 23rd, very, very important piece of work in terms of addressing the nuclear age, modern warfare. The Second Vatican Council and Church in the Modern World, 1965, the pastoral constitution um, of Vatican II, of which Dorothy participated in. These are all documents that we need to dig out and study and talk about, and I'm happy to see that um, Pope Francis is trying to revisit Vatican II just some of the subtle wording of his um, recent um, responses to the latest uh, saber rattling that's happening. And we can look to other people of faith, and not simply Christians, but he uses the terminology of including all peoples of various faiths to come together and witness for peace and work for peace. So it's I find it very, very hopeful. And so, of course, the, the Catholic social teachings are here to address peace, justice, and universal common good. This, this is what we need to achieve through our example as Catholics, as Christians, um, following these principles. And I just want to read to you some of the basic principles of these teachings, again, in common language. And I consider these our treasure to the world. These are, these are our pearls of wisdom. The dignity of the human person. All people are sacred and made in the image and likeness of God. 
Community and the common good. The human person is both sacred and social. When one suffers, we all suffer. And again, the mystical body concept. Rights and responsibilities. People have a fundamental right to life, food, shelter, health care, education, and employment. That has implications for economic and social policy, foreign policy, domestic policy. Option for the poor. The moral test of a society is how it treats its most vulnerable members. The dignity of work. The economy exists to serve the people, not the other way around. And once again, this segregation of person from work, um, the, the dullness of industrial work or meaningless work, what that does to the human spirit. That was spoken of a lot um, in the 1920s with the onset of industrialism. Solidarity. We are called to work globally for justice. Care of God's creation. We are called to protect God's people and the planet. And so I, I find it important to reiterate these principles um, again for all of us. And I like to present them before I talk about what I'm now currently doing. There is such contention and controversy with the resistance component of the Catholic worker movement. And I just need to touch upon some of the things that I have been involved with. I had a chance to travel to Afghanistan last January, February, staying there for a month under very harsh conditions. And I traveled with Kathy Kelly out of Chicago, Voices for Creative Nonviolence. She has been working very hard with a group called the Afghan Peace Volunteers. And these are young men who are trying to support their families, finish their education, and work for peace in Afghanistan. And this is a country that has witnessed 40 years of war, brutal, brutal war, um, with the Russian invasion, um, with the uh, warlords, with the Taliban, and now with the US military. And these young men have all experienced trauma. 90% of the country suffers from PTSD. And all of these boys have experienced death in their family, either through drone strikes or um, aerial bombardment or Taliban murders, Taliban um, murdering members, murdering their parents in front of them and, and stories like that. And so a part of why I felt the need to participate in such a uh, trip, Jesus has told us, I love to speak of Jesus in the present terms. I think that's important. He has told us to meet the enemy, to love the enemy, and I'm trying to understand what that means in, in these times. And so I went to Afghanistan to meet the enemy. And these um, young men are under the guidance of a doctor named Hakim. He met them in a refugee camp on the border of Pakistan um, prior to when the U.S. went in and took the Taliban out. And with the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, these families were able to move back to Bamiyan province. And so Hakim went home with them. He had grown so close to them. He went home with them and started a school for them. Literacy and infant mortality is, is uh, causing a desperate situation in Afghanistan. And so uh, he has been teaching them about Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, and Noam Chomsky's um, economic analysis. And, and they live together in community. And these are boys who come from different tribes, Hazara, Pashtun, Tajik. Um, and over the centuries, these tribes, uh, Afghanistan is a country of many peoples. And over the centuries, they have coexisted. And with the intervention of Western interests, things have fallen apart very badly. And so these boys are living together despite this tradition of warfare. And so they are faced every day with how to become pacifists. And they are also learning roles that are very different for them as males in their society. They are learning how to cook, clean, take care of each other. And it's, it's an incredible experiment in truth. And so we lived with them. And once again, I was doing 
work that was similar to running a household, working at Mary House, simply cooking, cleaning, being together, hearing stories, sharing our lives. And so I can't express how, how um, gratified I am to have that experience. Um, and it's very scary what's happening. It's very difficult to understand what's happening. The corruption is immense. There's been, I think the figure is $600 billion spent in the last decade in Afghanistan, and there's nothing to show for it other than war, poverty, um, 300 children a month, I'm sorry, a day are dying of lack of uh, appropriate drinking water. Um, there's no national grid, there's no decent water system in Kabul, there's no decent solid waste system, and the air is filled with dust that has one of the highest fecal contents in the world, and the standard of living is very, very low, and the life expectancy has decreased tremendously. So the effects of war have very much rended the social and family fabric of the entire population. To speak a little bit about some of my um, arrest experiences, we are, we've been involved with an organization called Witness Against Torture, which came out of Mary House Catholic Worker. Um, the situation in Guantanamo with um, the holding of Muslim prisoners, um, most of whom have been cleared of any charge of any crime. And we started with that by bringing habeas corpus petitions to the district court in Washington, D.C., literally giving the names of the prisoners, not our own names, and trying to bring justice, trying to hold our government accountable to international law and to bring our grievances to the government. So that has been a, a, an eye-opening experience for me. And part of the works of mercy do include um, visiting the imprisoned, and I think a very effective way of visiting the prisoner is to be arrested and be thrown in jail. And so a lot of the Catholic workers who find themselves in prison find themselves building community with those who are in jail and suffering tremendously. I mean, the population, the prison population has just been going up exponentially since this privatization. It's an industry. And so, again, I'm grateful to have had that experience in community. I would not recommend doing any resistance work outside of close community and careful discernment and prayer to really understand, you know, how to proceed with any of these actions. Um, I do have a case pending. Uh, I have a trial date of December 9th in Washington, D.C. Um, we were arrested in front of the White House, and typically the charges are related to trespass or failure to obey a lawful order. And of course, we're trying to look at the higher, the higher laws of um, international law. And also um, trying to defend our own constitutional rights. And the other... Um, project that I've been involved with is this business of using drones. Um, we have An Hancock Air Base in upstate New York, and they have a program of um, maintaining and training for the use of Reaper drones. And this um, technology has brought a whole different, uh, some people have likened it to the threshold that was crossed with the use of the atomic bomb, and that we don't know where this is bringing us to. We don't know what, this, what the implications are in terms of waging war without any declaration of war, um, bombing countries that we're not at war with, and just the, the whole industry of manufacturing drones, both armed and unarmed. And so I do have another case pending there. We brought an indictment to the colonel of the base stating that we felt that this was illegal never mind the, the morality question of it. And we, our goal is to get these um, issues into the courtroom, to be discussed, to be put on trial, to put this concept of the Guantanamo Bay prison camp on trial, to put this concept of drones on trial. And we typically go pro se, we defend ourselves, 
and we're not looking to avoid prosecution. Emin Hennessy talked about, you plead guilty, you never pay the fines, and you go to jail, and you serve your time as part of penance for our collective sinfulness. And so my life is very rich and very complex between doing the works of mercy and participating in resistance work within community. And I'm ever grateful for whatever this path is that I'm on, that I've been put on, and I'm not sure how it all has come about. I was very comfortable living in Vermont and taking care of my family until I got pushed out the door somehow. I do want to end with another reading of Dorothy's, and this was something she wrote in September 1964, Unpopular Front, and she's once again trying to explain herself. The Catholic worker is controversial also in its attitude to the war on poverty. To attack poverty by preaching voluntary poverty seems like madness, but again, it is direct action. Quote, the coat, the coat that hangs in your closet belongs to the poor, unquote. And to go further, if anyone takes your coat, give him your cloak too, which resonates with, with today's reading. To be profligate in our love and generosity, spontaneous, to cut all the red tape of bureaucracy. Quote, open your mouth and I will fill it, says the Lord in the Psalms. The more you give away, the more the Lord will give you to give. It is a growth in faith. It is the attitude of the man whose life of common sense and faith is integrated. To live with generosity in times of crisis is only common sense. In the time of earthquake, flood, fire, people give recklessly, even governments do. Thank you very much. So we will take questions and please ask your questions or give your comments in a very loud, clear voice so that everyone can hear. Yes? I'd like to know how you got pushed out the door. The invisible hand of God and Granny. I don't know how else to. <laughs> what about the you know, what was the, how did that happen? Like, well, my kids were grown up and out the door. It was part of the empty nest phase of my life, I suppose. I turned 50 and I said, oh gee, I think it's time for me to leave home because I had been in Vermont my entire life. And so as an occupational therapist, I took a job out in Hawaii. I got away from my husband and my mother as far away as I could go. And I think it was an exercise in exploring my faith. And it was then that I started to return to Mass. Um, my husband and my mother were not practicing Catholics. And so I felt I needed some elbow room. And one thing just led to another. I mean, I clearly understood Dorothy's um, work regarding social justice, but I was very uncomfortable with her piety and her religiosity, especially as a teenager and a young adult. And I had to come to grips with that aspect of her life, which meant I had to return to the Catholic Church. And so there were a variety of things that, that pushed me out the door. And one of them, this was 2004, 2005. And one of the th things also was that my son joined the military, which was one of the most excruciating moments of my life, other than watching my sister die of cancer. But the funny thing was that he was at Fort Benning in physical training, as what, my brother was in Fort Benning. And Dorothy visited my brother at Fort Benning in Georgia. And my son was there, and he had trouble breathing with the physical training, and he was out in five weeks. And I said, well, if that's not divine intervention, I don't know what <laughs> is. And I, I had to pay attention to that. He was you know, severely disappointed at the time, but in retrospect learned to understand what it actually ended up meaning. He inevitably would have been in Iraq. So that's the best I can describe the invisible hand. Yes? Uh, this is sort of a personal interest for me, collaboration between movements like the Catholic work and the pro-life movement, both of which are so motivated by Catholic teachings, but which seem to be in parallel when there should be so much more collaboration and integration. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see any hope for that in the future? 
I see hope for the seamless garment concept. Um, this is a trick question. Um, it's tough. It's difficult. It's very difficult. It's very personal. It's very difficult. She did not write about pro-life. She wrote about life. And I clearly believe in the concept of protection of life. Not just regarding abortion, but regarding capital punishment, regarding war, regarding euthanasia. You know, as an occupational therapist and as a Catholic, it's pretty clear to me. So, as far as the Catholic worker specifically and explicitly participating more with the pro-life movement, I don't know what to say. But thank you. Yes? I'd like to know, um, kind of personal application for many aspects of my life right now, but for everyone else as well, if there was one thing that you could impart on us that we could then in turn impart on young people that we have uh, relationships with and, and that we meet on a day-to-day -day basis that would help us achieve the goals that the Catholic worker is trying to achieve and, and the goals that we need to achieve in this world. What would like the one most important thing be that, that we could start with to get these people, these younger people interested to, to, to start this, this ball rolling, if you will, um, to start making some better progress? Well, Dorothy converted not to reform the church or to teach the church. She converted to reform herself. So I would have you turn the question onto yourself. What example, what example do we give in terms of our patience, kindness, perseverance? And I think we are called to set examples. I think that um, young people are very, very thirsty for the right example of how, how to live our lives and how to take care of each other. And I think the simple lesson is how to see the humanity in the other. And the best way to do that is through personal example. And that comes from the heart. I mean, we're, we're all so focused on the head, the intellect. But the only thing that I would say is giving encouragement and giving love at, at a very personal, basic level. I mean, that's all any of us want, is to, you know, be encouraged, to be acknowledged. And I think clarification of thought, roundtable discussions are always important to make available. Uh, reading, simply reading the daily readings, sharing the daily readings, and talking about what that means in one's own personal life, everyday life, how to live the gospel. I don't have any any other advice. It's send them to the Catholic worker houses. <laughs> um, wash dishes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Martha, I wanted to ask you about Dorothy Day as a mother and as a grandmother, as, yeah. as your grandma, a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as she proceeds towards sainthood and, um, you know, many of the attributes people will point to and have pointed to have to do with the movement and her public, you know, accomplishments and her, and her public life. But uh, what, what can you say more about um, what your mom remembered in terms of growing up with a, a mom who was a, a full-time mom and full-time Catholic worker? And, you know, in the movement, there's a little bit of kind of conventional wisdom. I don't know if this is true or not. Then Dorothy felt like, um, young uh, people who then got married and had kids maybe ought to be at a little bit of a distance from the worker, try, uh, mm -hmm. maybe not live in the houses. And I know a number of us who were Catholic workers and then got married, I mean, there's different models, but I know myself, we sort of have been a little bit at a distance to have this domestic life that mm -hmm. is not filled day by day with the, the homeless and yes. uh, demonstrations against war. So speak a little bit about how Dorothy reconciled that as a mother and what your mom and mm -hmm. what you felt about mm -hmm. her way of handling that. Thank you. Well, personal sacrifice certainly was part of it. Um, the movement started when Tamar was seven. The, both of them suffered 
tremendously over the separation. They were very, very close, and Dorothy was on the road working hard. Tamar was left with other people to take care of her. That was very hard on both of them. But Tamar also talked about uh, the joy, the excitement of living in community, the various people coming through, the experiences she had, um, a lot of wonderful, wonderful memories. And I think Dorothy reserved the right to be contradictory and contradict herself, um, whether she thought people should be raising kids in Catholic worker community or not. My sister raised her children in the Catholic worker community. Her last child was born at the Tivoli farm. And there were pros and cons of that, for sure. And the Catholic worker, th this is where young people were meeting and marrying and starting families. And I understand that um, this weekend there's the Sugar Creek gathering. And the Midwestern Catholic workers are young families raising kids in Catholic worker community. And I think that each community has to figure out, each family has to figure out its own balance and boundaries. And having your own kitchen and having your own space can make a big difference. Um, but it's up to the individual. I would say that um, in my experience, it's, it's been wonderful to, to see both aspects of being in family and being in community. I mean, I didn't raise my children in, in Catholic worker community. Um, that's something that the couples really have to decide for themselves. Um, but wonderful aspects and difficult aspects of it. And we have some kids growing up in the New York Catholic worker, at least next door. The parents worked many years there, and then as the kids came along, they got apartments next door. But the kids are still, you know, coming into the house and being part of the, the community in a different way. So there's all kinds of ways of doing it, diversity, variety. Yes? Thank you for your words sharing your experience. Um, and I guess my question has to do with uh, when I heard about working coming to Notre Dame, um, kind of resistance, because we have an ROTC program, felt that that was very compelling to me. Um, it made me think about things a little more deeply than I had previously. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, can you speak about how her legacy um, can speak to us as an urban community um, who participate in uh, acts of war on a daily basis. Yeah. Well, it's pretty clear from Jesus' point of view. He spent the last 24 hours of his life reiterating over and over again what we were to do. Put up your sword. Um, be willing to die before you're willing to kill. And what does that look like? What does that mean? And things get more and more complicated as we develop institutions and develop bureaucracies. And we find ourselves further and further away from basic truths. And we have the highest standard of living in the world. And as I had said earlier, that comes at an extreme cost to the rest of the world. And we are complicit. We are deeply indicted and embedded in this war machine. I mean, we have, we have a permanent war economy. And until we're willing to take a look at what that means, what the implications are of devoting all of our resources, technology, research and development, our, all of our treasure and blood is dedicated to war making. And I understand that, that this particular university has one of the most um, complete programs. And once again, it's this question of, in today's reading, I mean, you'll be persecuted. Let's just read, let's just read the Beatitudes. This is what happens when we 
speak truth. You know, we are persecuted and we forfeit. We forfeit. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. God blesses those who, whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Do we forfeit our careers? Do we forfeit our educations? Do we forfeit our way of life? Do we forfeit our standard of living? What does this take? This takes tremendous courage. And the economy is now completely embedded in a national security state. And I understand that a lot of money is being put into our institutions, our universities, with the focus of war. I mean, we have Lockheed Martin, we have Northrop, Northrop Grumman, we have General Dynamics. There is huge profit to be made in bombing Syria. And what is our choice? What is our option? What, how, how will we choose? How will we declare ourselves as Catholics and as Christians? And I think perhaps the most dangerous thing about our times is that this national security apparatus, the screws are tightening. I'm experiencing this in terms of these um, acts of resistance that we participate in. You know, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, um, petitioning our government for grievances. It's becoming more and more difficult. And this business of striking anywhere, anytime, on the planet, at will, and killing. I mean, is that playing God or, or, or what? And you know, we are supporting this kind of infrastructure. This is what's before us. And I don't know what else to say other than I've seen the barrel end of the gun. We are on the trigger end of the gun. And until we go forth and see what our policies are doing, we can be quite oblivious and quite comfortable in our standard of living. Yes. Um, I was just going to ask, what do you make of Dorothy's uh, famous quote? I don't know verbatim, but to paraphrase, um, don't call me a saint. I don't want to be written out that easily. Yes. Um, just in light of the quest for a candidate. Mm -hmm. Well, we're all called to be saints. We're all called to behave like saints as best we can. And I think that it's, it's very clear what we have to do to practice that. And her point being, she didn't want to be, you know, held above others. She didn't want to be put on a pedestal and admired. She's not about theory, she's about practice. And we need our saints, we desperately need our saints, and especially our saints of, of our current times. And she is certainly an appropriate saint for our times. And so I think one of her greatest um, objections were to the fact that it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to canonize someone. And the money needs to be sent, spent on the poor, feeding the, feeding the hungry. But we're, we're hopeful. We're hopeful that Pope Francis will get very excited about her cause and that she's be held up as one who opposed modern war. There is no such thing as just war. Thank you.
behalf of all the sponsors and all of us here, we thank you so much for encouraging us on the way of discipleship and for, um, for your witness to the gospel and reminding us of Dorothy's witness to the gospel. Yes. Um, just before our talk this evening, um, the Dorothy J room upstairs on the first floor of the Center for Social Concerns um, was blessed. We gathered there with Martha and uh, we were friends with Father Paul Coleman, and it was blessed. There's a collection of a couple of Dorothy's books there, so we invite you to go visit the Dorothy Day Room to sit and to read. Um, also, if anyone is interested in becoming more involved with the Catholic Worker here in South Bend or elsewhere, or the, uh, the Catholic Peace Fellowship, there are some materials in the back. Please join me once again in thanking Martha.